and welcome to this year's Holocaust Memorial Lecture. My name is Claire Langhammer and I'm the Director of the Institute of Historical Research. And we are extremely proud to be involved in tonight's event in which commemoration and remembrance meets new scholarship and knowledge. This annual lecture stems from a partnership with the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. And I'm co-chairing this event tonight with its director, Professor David Feldman. The Birkbeck Institute is committed to the multidisciplinary study of antisemitism through research and teaching. It also contributes to public debate and understanding on antisemitism and provides expertise and advice to public and political institutions in the UK, Europe and globally. My own institute seeks to promote the value and importance of history in public life, as well as within the universities. I will shortly introduce our speaker, Professor Tim Cole, but before I do so, I would like to run through the way we will be operating over the next hour. You've all been muted upon entry to the Zoom room, and we ask you to stay muted um, throughout the session to avoid those kind of sound problems that I'm sure you're all um, familiar with. Tim will be speaking for around 30 minutes uh, and then there will be time for questions. We're acutely aware of the challenges of audience participation when the numbers in attendance are quite so large as they are tonight, uh, but we're also very keen that you should be able to voice your own questions where possible. If you have a question that you would like to ask, please could you put it in the chat function and we will call upon you to voice it or you can raise your hand um, in the function that's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, David's going to be um, doing the, the um, challenging task um, of dealing with the questions um, in the second part of the session. I'd perhaps add that in order to allow as many people as possible um, to ask their questions, that it would be good if we could keep questions fairly short. And I thank you in advance for that. And I'd like to add that we'll be recording um, tonight's event, so there will be a chance to revisit the talk um, if you should choose at a later point. And I want to turn to introduce Tim. Uh, Tim Cole is Professor of Social History at the University of Bristol, and he's also Director of the Brigstow Institute which fosters interdisciplinary research on what it means to be human in the 21st century. His research ranges widely across social, landscape and environmental histories, digital humanities, and has a particular focus on the Holocaust and how it is remembered. His books include Holocaust Landscapes from 2016, Traces of the Holocaust, from 2011, and a co-edited collection of essays arising from a research project that he co-led called Geographies of the Holocaust in 2014. Tim will talk to us tonight on mapping the Holocaust. Thank you, Tim, for in advance, and I'll hand over to you to share your screen. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Claire. Um, and thank you, David, as well, um, for the kind invitation. And thank you all of you for um, coming along to, um, to listen to this talk. And um, when Claire and David um, invited me to speak, um, I um, started thinking a little bit about anniversaries. I guess I am a historian um, after all, um, but I'm also a geographer. And so my thoughts turned to 1982 and 40 years ago um, and a particular historiographical anniversary, which was the publishing um, of Martin Gilbert's um, first edition of um, his Atlas um, of the Holocaust. And, and many of you may know um, of the book. You may have a, a copy to hand um, close to your um, laptop or computer or iPad. And those of you who um, do may well recall um, this very first map that's embedded um, in the, um, the text in one of the opening pages. It's a map um, that introduces the Atlas um, where Gilbert maps out um, the places of birth, um, the places of work, and the places of execution of 17 Jews who were murdered during the war. And those 17 Jews reappear throughout the rest of the Atlas. Their, their stories are, are traced out. 
what's always intrigued me is, is what um, Gilbert writes um, after introducing this map. If a similarly short reference were made to each Jew murdered between 1939 and 1945, 353,000 such maps would be needed. To draw these maps at the author's and cartographer's fastest rate of a map a day would take more than 967 years, he writes. And so he leaves us with this one map of 17 Jews, stories of birth and death, um, but not the other 353,000 maps of 17 other Jews times 353,000. Now, the idea of the limits of mapping is something that I want to return to um, at the end of this talk, um, but I want to talk about that in a slightly different way. But what Gilbert does here is he raises the question of the impossibility of mapping the Holocaust, given the scale of the event. The nature of this particular um, genocide is such that Gilbert assumes it would take a cartographer a thousand years to get the job done. But things have changed since the time um, of Gilbert, in particular with the coming of digital technology. A lot's happened in, in the 40 years since 1982. This may be a place um, familiar to some of you. It's um, Block 27 in um, Auschwitz I, the museum um, in, in Auschwitz, um, where um, there is a copy of the Book of Names um, created by Yad Vashem, um, containing the names of um, 4.2 million Jews um, with their places of birth and their places of death when known. And given the nature of digital technology, it would now be potentially possible to take the underlying database that created the Book of Names and to map the places of birth of 4.2 million Jews and the places of death of 4.2 million Jews. In short, the thing that Gilbert thought was impossible 40 years ago has now become possible because of digital technology. And what I want to do in this short lecture is to explore some of the potentials that I see within digital mapping to help us maybe understand the Holocaust and to think about Holocaust memory in new ways, but also to introduce a sense of limits. So like Gilbert, to suggest in some ways that the nature of the genocide is such that there's also limits to its mappability. One of the things that, that Gilbert does in his own work is to focus, and this is, I think, typical of the, the state of the historiography in the 1980s, is very much upon what was done to the Jews. Um, so in a sense, a kind of passive victim of Nazi violence. Um, but as he says, to think of, in particular about a reference to where it was done. And that idea of identifying where the crime was committed is one that has continued um, to interest scholars and memory activists, I think, in the years um, since Gilbert. Just to give a, a couple of examples, the work of um, archeologists in part has been about uncovering mapping, if you like, in particular the killings um, in the former occupied Soviet space. Um, if you think of um, the work of Father Patrick Dubois in literally sifting through um, uh, shells of, um, of, uh, um, of, of, of bullet shells to uncover um, a Holocaust by bullets in the East. Or um, closer to home, for those of us from the UK, the work of Caroline Sturdy Coles, um, an archeologist uh, based in Staffordshire, um, who has been uncovering the archeology span of Treblinka um, to think about the location of the gas chambers. Or over on the right, um, one of many encyclopedic projects that have been implemented in particular by a number of key educational and memory institutions. In this case, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, massive encyclopedia project to try and map, locate um, all of the camps within occupied Europe and now all more recently, all of the ghettos. Um, similar projects have been undertaken by Yad Vashem in Israel on a ghettos encyclopedia and by the Technical University in Berlin um, literally in a project called the Place of Terror. So, locating the Holocaust is something um, that has been uh, uh, done, I think, from Gilbert onwards by a number of scholars and also by a number of memory institutions. And I think there's still a place for mapping to be an act of locating, of finding out where the Holocaust um, took place not just as an act of memory, but also, I think, as an act of um, analysis. And maybe I can give you a couple of quick examples of that. 
One of my um, colleagues, um, Anne Kelly Knowles, is a historical um, geographer, and she's been working with um, Paul Jescott, an architectural historian, um, to map out the encyclopedia created by the um, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She started with the camps encyclopedia, and now the project she's working on is the ghettos. What I offer here is just a number of quick stills from 1933 to 34 in the top left, where you see the beginnings of the SS camp system. And then uh, moving to the right, um, the beginning of larger camps in 36 to 39, down in the bottom left, the growth of the larger camps. And then in 44, the explosion of the camp system as a whole series of sub camps and labor camps are created. And it's one of the things that I think is most striking about the project that Anne's undertaken is to call attention to the fact that 1944 sees um, the, this explosion of the SS camp system as the Nazi state turns from thinking solely about murder to thinking increasingly about labor in a last attempt um, to win the war. What's striking about Anne's work is that it combines both place and time in the sense it brings geography and history together through a series of maps that help us to start to think about spatial patterns and the kinds of ways in which a genocide is enacted not just over time but also in and through space uh, and that space matters. Another example comes from the work of Alberto Giordano and Anna Hollian who've mapped out um, deportations of Jews from Italy. Uh, they've worked with an underlying database of Italian deportees and try to think about the kinds of patterns that emerge um, if you start to map where Italian Jews are arrested. Um, and in particular, who's doing that arresting? This is one of the maps that they produce as they overlay using digital techniques, both the places of arrest, and also in this case, um, who's doing the arresting. On the left, a map of German arrests of Italian Jews, on the right, a map of Italian arrests of Italian Jews. And what you see is these very different spatial patterns that German arrests tend to be very large numbers of Jews concentrated in urban areas and also in the um, Italian Swiss border region. Italian arrests tend to be much more spatially dispersed across the entire um, uh, uh, country. And that pattern is something that they've also mapped out temporarily as they bring space and time together. Um, what you see in blue is Italian arrests, arrests by Italian officials, in red, arrests by Germans. And what you see is a, is a similar, um, if you like, temporal pattern of very large numbers of Jews initially arrested by Germans, but then gradually Italians playing a critical role in arresting Jews as time and space go on. And the work, I think, is really suggestive. It points to the, the importance of local knowledge in arresting smaller numbers of Jews in a much more dispersed way, that the final more dispersed actions that take place within the deportations in Italy, crucially are undertaken by Italian agents, not by German agents. And that has incredible historiographical significance, but also has real significance for kind of memory politics within the context of contemporary Italy. But one thing that I think mapping can do is, can do more than map location. Here I draw on the work of um, geographers, in particular a guy called John Agnew, who um, encourages us to think about space and place as more than location. Um, in some ways, the maps that I've shown you so far are much more a series of maps of latitude and longitude, of literally a dot on the map. Sure, those dots are overlaid with other information, whether it's Germans or Italians who are arresting Jews in this particular location. But it's working, if you like, with a, a way of seeing the world which is primarily framed around imagining space and place as, as, as coordinates, as latitude and longitude. One of the things that John Agnew encourages us to do is to think about space and place as much more than simply dots on maps. And I think this resonates with um, the work of um, those of us who are historians. As historians, in particular historians of Europe know, um, a place on the map could literally change name over the course of the 19th and 20th century with a whole series of empires and territorial expansions. If you like, the latitude and longitude stays the same but actually the meaning of that place, the kind of geopolitical or political or cultural meaning of that place shifts rapidly. And so mapping locale is about more than just mapping out dots on a map. It's about thinking about the politics of those dots or places. It's thinking about the materiality of those places. It's thinking about the cultural and social qualities of those places. And it's here, I think, that mapping maybe has the most to contribute to us as historians. 
Um, and also to bring, I think, much, not just to Holocaust historiography, but also to Holocaust memory. And perhaps I can give a couple of examples um, of that. First of all, some of my own work um, and work that I've done with Alberto um, Giordano, I've long been interested in, in Budapest, in Hungary, um, and in the unusual nature of the ghetto in that city, rather than being a closed ghetto like in Warsaw, Jews are um, literally dispersed across the city. Um, initially, in the beginning of June, in, in just over two and a half thousand ghetto houses, and then a month later, in about 2,000 ghetto houses, and most Budapest Jews remain in those ghetto houses, spread all the way across the city until the winter of 1944-1945, when finally uh, a closed ghetto is set up, as well as a, um, a ghetto area for Jews protected by the neutral powers, um, Val Wallenberg being the sort of most famous name, I guess, associated with that. Now, this map is a map of location. It's a map that takes the ghetto archive, and it, 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 if you like, attributes a dot on the map. But any of us who know Central European cities know that buildings are not just dots on the map. That in a Central European city, in the center and the heart of the city, those buildings are very large apartment buildings with a gateway that opens into a central courtyard from which rises a staircase and a whole series of internal balconies up three, four, maybe five stories. Whereas out in the outskirts of a city, um, they might be much smaller um, family houses. And so one of the things um, that we've done is to try and bring a sense of that to play by um, overlaying the census data from 1941 with those dots on the map. If you like to make some of those dots larger and some of them smaller, to recognize that this isn't just a map of location, ghetto as location, but this is also a map of ghetto as locale, that some of these places are bigger than others. And what were the implications of that um, for the, the Jews that live there? A couple of things I think are really significant about that. First, it caused us to reimagine the story we told of ghettoization in this particular city. I think traditionally, and this is some of my own earlier work, where I think I was thinking about the limits of map as location rather than thinking about locale. In many ways, I made much of play of the fact that a set of ghetto plans down in the bottom left changed radically to um, these yellow star houses, two and a half thousand spread throughout the city in the top, as they came down in the, in the bottom uh, to 1900 houses and then over on the right as they ended up with two ghettos. But actually by introducing a sense of um, population size to the map, what we find is that essentially the ghetto doesn't change shape, that the center of gravity of the ghetto remains the same, that the story of ghettoization in this particular city is a story of continuity, not change. And it's a story less of taking the Jew to the ghetto and more bringing the ghetto to the Jew, of recognizing and acknowledging where Jews already lived within the city. But something else that became more important to us was to think about what did it mean to live in one of these central large apartment buildings? And in particular, what did it mean in terms of access to not just other Jews across the city, but to healthcare within the Jewish hospitals that were allowed to um, persist, to um, vegetables in the market halls, and most critically in the summer and autumn of 1944 to the protective paperwork being offered by the, the neutral legations. What we did was map out the, the neutral legations, in this case, um, the, 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 the Swedish legations, and to start thinking about how um, close those were to where these ghetto houses were, a 30 minute walking distance, and then a 60 minute walking distance, and then much more than an hour. And it started to point to uh, a new way of thinking about um, the oral history archive. And here, I think what's significant is reimagining mapping as less a kind of final output that a historian does, as almost kind of an end product, and much more part of a research journey, much more part of a process. Because suddenly what this mapping did was it took me back to an oral history archive with a new set of lenses, which were lenses interested in distance and proximity, and in particular to how critical non-Jews living within these ghetto buildings were for the Jews that lived there. In large ghetto buildings, a larger number of Jewish neighbors may well have been incredibly important if they were long-standing social networks in accessing Swedish paperwork. That many started to talk about the fact that they got protected paperwork, not because they managed to get there, but because a non-Jewish neighbor who'd been allowed to live in their building got there. And suddenly I started to reimagine the ghetto in Budapest as a place where actually Jews and non-Jews are brought into intimate contact, 
um, Jewish neighbors and non-Jewish neighbors and the relationship between them becomes critical in understanding survival in the autumn and winter of 1944. Let me give you another example from the work of um, Paul Jascott. Uh, and what Paul Jascott did was took the um, architectural archive um, from Auschwitz and began to map it out. In a sense, like, I think like the work that Alberto and I was doing, Paul and, and Anne Kelly Knowles together, we're interested in what happens when you take an archive and you start to map it and you start to use the map as a way to ask a set of questions. And a set of questions that are particularly framed less around location and much more around locale. One thing that he became interested in was the way that the archive lied. What appeared in the archive and didn't appear on the ground? What appeared on the ground and didn't appear in the archive? To start to bring into a conversation, if you like, the imagined perfect plan of Auschwitz as a new Germanized city with the reality on the ground and to think about the shifting priorities of how Auschwitz is, is rebuilt. Here you see um, the things in green. Um, in the city, they're actually built according to the ideal plan, but everything else is either not on the plan and is built or is built um, uh, and, uh, or is, is on the plan, but never built um, in the case of, um, uh, of Orange. But they also became interested in particular in thinking about Birkenau and thinking about um, how do you take an architectural um, uh, archive um, as a way of mapping it out and thinking about the nature of um, Birkenau as a place, Auschwitz Birkenau as a place, and in particular of Jewish experience there. And so one of the things that you see here is literally just mapping out the number of buildings being built in Auschwitz-Birkenau at any one period in time from 41 on the left all the way through to 44 on the right with these two huge peaks of building um, taking place um, in, uh, in the spring, early spring of 1943, and then again in the early spring of 1944. What they did was then start to lay that out onto um, the plan of Birkenau to start to think about how Birkenau looked in um, 43 during these peaks of building, what was being built here shaded in red and into um, the beginning of 1944. And then to visualize that by using viewshed analysis. So to think about, well, what does Birkenau look like from the ground up? Um, what's the nature of construction within this particular um, site? It's a, a familiar view in many ways from the gateway into Birkenau at the bottom right up to where the two main gas chambers are up at the top left. But in a sense, what it offers, I think, is a very unfamiliar of Auschwitz-Birkenau because it calls our attention to Auschwitz-Birkenau for many months being essentially a construction site, a vast building site, that the majority of Auschwitz-Birkenau was constantly being built. And that had important implications. It was a far more chaotic space than we often imagine. Much of the historiographical literature, and much of the memorial literature on um, Birkenau is a kind of imagining of this place um, as the panoptical gaze, as a, a, as a kind of vast concentration camp where there's clear sight lines everywhere. And this starts to muddy the waters in some ways and to suggest that actually within the chaos there was opportunity as well as peril. What they discovered was that the greatest number of escapes from Birkenau took place at the height of building, when building uh, was central to Birkenau, when Birkenau was a construction site, there was opportunity in that construction site for Jewish prisoners to escape. And this work really brings us to the kind of final idea that Agnew offers, which is that space and place is always more than just a, a dot on a map. And it's always more than a kind of material, social, cultural, political space. It's also something that is much more emotional. Um, if you think of where you're sitting now, um, you could think of the latitude and longitude of, um, of your house. You could think about the materiality of your house and the social relations. Um, I've got the kids upstairs and I've told them to stay off the internet until we're finished with this lecture. But you also think of your house as, as home, as somewhere that has an emotional tenor and tenant to it. And this, I think, is one of the most challenging things for us to try and map. How do we start to try and map out, if you like, Jewish experience? How do we map out the Holocaust as not just something done to Jews in particular places, as characterized Gilbert's work, but as something that's experienced by Jews? And I just want to finish with two final examples that in some ways draw us back to the challenge of the unmappability of genocide. One of the, um, the project teams um, that were part of the work that, um, that Claire mentioned in the Geographies of the Holocaust Project uh, was led by um, Simone Gigliotti 
um, a cartographer called Eric Steiner uh, and a scholar Mark Mazarowski. And one of the things that he wanted to do was to map out the evacuations or death marches from Auschwitz in um, January 1945. As I think many know, um, at this final point in the war, um, there's a moment where almost the, the entire camp is, is on the move. Uh, as tens of thousands of prisoners are rapidly marched in the middle of 1945 um, along the road network and the rail network um, of um, occupied Poland um, and into um, Germany. And then those prisoners are dumped in camps um, further west in this kind of ever shrinking Reich um, at this particular point in the war. Now it's possible to map the location of, of those routes, and this is what that map shows us. Um, uh, it's a useful map. It shows us what routes um, people took um, in January the 17th um, in brown, January the 18th in yellow, and January the 19th. Um, and it also shows us what the SS plan was in green. And it shows us again this sense in which maps in some ways point uh, to the, um, the clash of ideology and pragmatics within, within the Nazi state. Now, it's also possible to map locale. Um, it's possible to map the topography of these routes, and that's something that the team did. Um, these are never just flat routes. They have inclines and they have descents. Um, inclines and descents, um, which were deadly um, in the context of a snowy winter in January 45, and in the context of um, disease and hunger and poor footwear that characterize the lot of the prisoner. But what they were really interested in trying to think about was, well, how do you map um, sense of place? How do you map um, what it feels like to be part of this? Like, how do you map a death march in that much more kind of experiential, um, experiential way? Is it possible to do that? And what they did, I think, which was interesting, was that they began to map testimony. Um, this is just an example from some of their work, which I, I think is really um, productive and really stimulating to think about, about how we might map a sense of place as historians um, more generally, and maybe as um, historians of the Holocaust in particular. They took um, the, um, the, the words, um, the post-war rhetoric uh, of, um, of, uh, of, of Polish um, prisoners, a group of Polish uh, female prisoners. Um, these are accounts given within um, a judicial system in the post-war period. Here's one example uh, where they, they took um, an account of the, um, of the march and then literally started to map that account out onto the route. So at the top um, is the place of departure, um, and then at the bottom is the place of arrival. Um, and what they do right at the bottom is something during the march sometime. And then they took a whole bunch of women who were all part of the same um, evacuation, and they did the very same thing. So to map out along the route, where do women talk about along this route? As they describe a 60 kilometer journey, which bits of that journey do they describe? And then they took all of that together and started to create these kind of mappings, in a sense, of, of, of absence and presence within a testimonial archive. So within the language of these women's um, taken together, and, and you see blown up here, it's literally every single letter from every single word in the testimonial archive, which is mapped out against um, this route from top to bottom. They began to map out um, the noise, and the silence and to ask the question of what was remembered and what was forgotten, what happened at the places of memory and what happened at the places of absence of memory. And to my sense, I think there's something really productive here about thinking about how we might map memory in more sophisticated ways than, um, than location and locale enable. And this is something that I've been really struck by in the work of um, Hannah Pollengale, um, Hannah Pollengale's done uh, a really brilliant um, book recently about um, interviews with Lithuanian survivors. She's particularly interested in the geography of retelling. So what happens to the story when it's retold in Lithuania, when it's retold in Israel, when it's retold in, um, in uh, the United States. But in another piece of work, she thought about the kinds of conflict that appears between the retelling of a survivor and the digital map. And this is what you find on the VHA um, Visual History Archive, USC Shoah Foundation um, home screen. On the left, you find the testimony of the survivor. On the right, you find a map that's very familiar to all of us, a Google map that operates with um, latitude and longitude that shows location. And literally, as Hannah um, Galani talks through her Holocaust story, in a sense, you can follow on the map this movement through a number of locations as she moves from her home, Lithuania, through a whole series um, of camps. But there's a point um, where um, Hannah Pollengelai points out 
um, this disjuncture between what the survivor is saying and what the map is showing. Because the map confidently shows us that um, Golani is now in Stutov, in the camp of Stutov, and we know the latitude and longitude of Stutov, but the testimony is much more fragmentary. The testimony um, talks about a black hole rather than a camp and talks about a field in a no place rather than a place with a kind of confidence latitude and longitude attached to it. And this is what um, Hannah Paul and Galli writes. When Galani depicts Stutoff as a black hole, insisting I was in a field in a no place, she drastically violates the very geographical terms to which both she and the interviewer have committed up until now. Deportation to a concentration camp, Galani tells us, denied her of something she deeply cherishes, the right to feel, understand, and control her own physical presence in the world. This is a message that argues against the uniformly measured indexical map at the side. And that brings us, I think, back to Gilbert's first map in the Atlas and Gilbert's sense of disquiet, that it was impossible to map the Holocaust. For him, the impossibility lay in the challenge of spending a thousand years drawing hand-drawn maps at the rate of one a day to encapsulate the scale of this genocide. But as I hope I've suggested, in the digital age, I think we still face a challenge. It's just a different kind of challenge. It's an existential and important challenge. As I hope I've shown, I think there is a value to digital mapping, not just as an output within memory projects, um, but also as a research process within historical projects. That mapping, I think, in particular, not just mapping um, location, the latitude and longitude of where the Holocaust took place, but that much more complex stuff that we're interested in as historians, which is that places are locales that are socially, politically, culturally, economically constructed, that mapping that I think can be really useful at generating new research questions and causing us to look afresh at the archive. But I think there's also a point at which mapping comes up to limits, and in particular digital mapping comes up to limits. Because digital lapping always suggests the perfectibility. As I suggested, it would be possible, I think, now to take the underlying database that Yad Vashem has and to map the book of names and to map the places of birth and the places of death of 4.2 million Jews. But as I think Gilani and Hannah Pauline Galai and also Simone Gigliotti and Eric Steiner caution us, there's something about the nature of this experience that is unmappable and that unmappability might be particularly important. It might be key to this experience of dislocation from home to a place that was far from home, from a place that was locatable on a map to a place that was not locatable on a map. In a sense, I think the unmappability of the Holocaust is just as important as the mappability of the Holocaust as we come to grips with this genocide. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tim, for um, um, an extraordinary talk. I mean, it, it, um, it, it's like uh, it, it was like a half hour um, message from from a very demanding, uh, technically demanding, conceptually demanding front line of research, um, which um, throws up lots of lots of questions i mean um i think i'd just like to ask you a question to to start us off um which is i suppose in a way it takes up off from where you left off and it's about how this work is received by um other scholars of the Holocaust, because one of the themes that recurred through your work, uh, uh, through your talk, is how um, how mapping the Holocaust interacts with other forms of sources, architect the architectural archive, the, it's the testimonial archive, um, as you spoke about, and then other sorts of questions, which at first sight seem a long way from mapping, and then you show in some ways are not. So your, your last comments about, um, about, um, um, about 
mapping testimony and so forth. So in my mind, that raises a question of to what extent scholars of the Holocaust who are not trained in geography, who don't have a digital imagination, to what extent do you think they have shown themselves able to take advantage of the insights of this sort of work? Or is there much more work to be done in that regard? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that's a great question, David. I think there's probably two things I suggest, and I, I'm really conscious of this. Um, there were a few years ago, Anne Kelly Knowles and myself, we ran a, um, a workshop at USHMM in Washington, DC um, for academics who were interested in mapping the Holocaust. The thing we said to them was, um, don't spend all your time learning GIS um, and don't um, throw yourself into a kind of intensive one year or two year um, digital um, GIS course. Um, just start with some tracing paper because um, all dig um, GIS is, is a very complicated way of layering three um, bits of tracing paper or five bits of tracing paper that brings um, data together on the same plane. Um, and that's something that, you know, I try and do with my students um, or I try and do with others, which is just to say, let's, let's just draw this out. And one of the things that I think mapping does do is that it encourages us historians to think about the visual about visualizing as a part of a, of a historical methodology. Because I think as historians, we're often loath to do that. We don't do much drawing, <clears throat> that we don't just kind of go to an archive and start ideally sketching. We get busy doing textual stuff. So we're really kind of obsessed with textual stuff. We copy out great chunks of text from the archive um, on, with our notebook and pen. And one of the things that, that in a sense I think mapping does is it encourages us to start visualizing archives to start drawing them out. Um, so to, to start coloring things in and thinking about, well, actually, is there a way that I could see an archive in a different way if I started visualizing it? And, and that's one of the things that I think is a really important part of the mapping work is a call to historians to, um, to visualize, to think visually, um, and to think about how visualizing an archive might help us to see things that are unseen um, from the, the narrow focus that we have. I think the second thing that it does is to call attention to spatial patterns. And I guess this is part of my broader interest is um, thinking about, well, what does history look like? What does Holocaust studies look like after the spatial turn? So what kinds of spatial patterns emerge? Because I think one of the things that mapping does is it really brings those spatial patterns to the Oops. fore. So an example, I think is say in Alberto and Anna's work on Italian deportations, um, that there's a really um, yeah, spatial pattern that takes place there, I think. Um, that's that's visible once you start mapping but I don't think you necessarily have to map to see spatial patterns but I think mapping can help to bring space to the fore and that's one of the things that I'm really interested in I think as a historian who's also a geographer um, is I'm really interested in the intersections of time and space so how can we think about the fact that any historical event um, has a chronology but also a geography that it unfolds over time but it also unfolds over space and so in a sense for me, mapping is a way of trying to bring that to the fore. And, and I guess one of the things I'm really interested in with digital mapping is the possibility of animated mapping, allowing us to bring space and time into the same um, locale and to start thinking about the Holocaust as an event that moves across the European continent over time and space and to try and um, explore it in those terms. So in some ways it's, it's about, I guess, almost David, a, a kind of new dynamism bringing a, a much stronger sense of dynamic to the kinds of events we're interested in as historians. Thank you, Tim. Um, I see that Rachel Burns um, um, has a question. And um, so um, if you ask at yours uh, in just a moment, I, I also so see that Richard Turner has a question. So after Rachel will come to, uh, and after, um, Tim has answered, we'll come to, uh, to you, Richard. I also see uh, that there are some questions in the chat um, and I'll come to them uh, after those two. Rachel. Thank you. Um, it was fascinating. Um, I, I have a question. You were saying about um, mapping the death marches and I wondered if using something like a walking methodology is beneficial here because having looked at a number of maps of the Holocaust, many of which you have created, um, and then to be in some of these spaces 
there's so much that one can't get from a map that one can get in person and being in a particular space. If, if you could speak to that, please. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a great question, um, Rachel. And I think, I think back to Simon Sharma's work um, where Simon Sharma um, talks about um, the archive of the feet. So he encourages historians um, not just to go into the archive um, of uh, the paperwork of the state, uh, but also the archive, which is the landscape um, within Europe, recognizing that that landscape changes. But I think you're absolutely right about the importance of field work. Um, within historical practice. And I think that's something that historical geographers really um, led the way with. If you think about um, the early work of historical geographers like Hoskins work um, on the British landscape, there's a strong tradition within British historical geography of reading the landscape being central um, as a kind of partner to archival work. And in many ways, I think that, that to me is something that I, I'd, I'd love us all to be doing more as historians. Um, especially because I think of that sense of, of locale and sense of place as you hint at, that those things are really best explored in part through bringing the testimonial archive into conversation with the, the sites and places where these things um, take place. Um, and I think you're right, Rachel, that walking is probably uh, an underappreciated art um, within the historical profession. Um, and actually there's a real value to adopting that as, as part of our methodology. Social sciences as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Um, Richard Turner. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. So, my, um, sort of, firstly, an observation is that, that you know when I've seen maps before um, with distributions of um, concentration camps, they don't always make make it clear like you've done that. Um, that this was something that, that culminated in 1944. And I think one of the benefits of GIS is that you, it's dynamic. You can see change over time. Mm -hmm. And I was never fully aware that, that so many of these camps appeared really quite late in the day. Um, that I don't think that's always fully, you know, is there anything you can, more you can say about that? But also, is there anything we can say about the distribution um, you know, why they're distributed in particular ways. You get these, these groups, you know, with, with one main camp and then camps around it. What can we say about why these different groupings are where they are? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a great question, Richard, because I think you're dead right that one of the things that's really changed about digital technologies is the possibility now for much more dynamic mapping that brings time into the equation. And I think that is one of the challenges. If you think about Gilbert's Atlas, it has a series of static maps, um, which often remind me of that map. Those of you that have been to Auschwitz, you know that map when you walk into the beginning of the exhibition where all the train lines lead to Auschwitz? Um, that's a, a map that you find within Gilbert, but Gilbert also has a map where the trains start to send people out of Auschwitz into this massive number of um, subcamps that have been created in 1944, and that's not a map you do see. And in a sense, what you need, I think, is that dynamic map, if you think about Auschwitz, that Jews are being sent to Auschwitz at, up until 1944, where there's a turning point where Jews are starting to be sent, for example, to Mauthausen, and then increasingly sent out um, to a whole series of other camps as a whole camp network is exploding. And it's that sense of, of dynamism of change over time and space that I think digital mapping um, allows us to achieve. Why that takes place, I think, is a, is a great question. And one of the things that I think is really useful here, again, is another dimension of digital mapping, which I've alluded to, which is the possibility of overlaying additional information. So one thing that you see, I think, quite clearly, if you map out the camp system, and this is something that Anne Kelly Knowles has been interested in doing, um, is that you see a shift from um, a primacy with construction to a primacy with munitions. So that originally camps, when you think of where the subcamps, the labor camps are being placed, they're being placed next to things like brickworks, to quarries, um, to sources of clay. So if you start to map out literally the geology, the substrata um, of the Reich, what you start to see is you see a particular um, geography to camp construction, which is framed around the importance of building, um, rebuilding Berlin for the Führer, or building, um, in the case of somewhere like Neungamme, um, uh, a city like Hamburg for the Führer. So bricks and stone really determine a lot of where these subcamps um, appear. And, you know, those of you that have been to Matthausen know that in the case of, of Matthausen or Flossenburg, the proximity to quarries. But there's a shift. Increasingly, I think what you see um, is that camps are being built, much smaller camps around munitions. 
Um, they're build, built around um, munitions for BT rockets that are being um, tunneled into the grounds, um, but are, are being built around a different set of, of, of geographical factors that are not about where clay is, brick clay, and not around where um, stone is. And so one of the things that I think, um, you know, I think is really important is about how do we bring multiple layers into the map as part of a kind of research process that interrogates those questions to ask the questions about, well, why were camps built where they were? And one of the things, you know, Richard, that's really intrigued us is the way that some sub camps are very close to the main camp and some can be as far as hundred miles or more away from the sub camp. And we haven't got to the bottom of that because those maps in a sense are still part of an unanswered set of questions. They point to a set of spatial patterns that we haven't yet got to the bottom of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. We, we have a, a, an increasing number of questions in the chat. I'm sure we won't get through all of them, but as a way of getting through as many as possible, I, I think I'll just convey a two or three now to Tim and ask him to um, um, answer them as best he can as, um, as uh, yes. So uh, I think one question, which will be of interest to a lot of people here is from Paul Hertzberg, who asks whether a digital uh, technology and the sort of work you've been talking about um, has a role to play in refuting Holocaust denial. Um, and um, another <coughs> question from Rosemary and 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 Jonathan or Rosemary or Jonathan, it, it, uh, the major camps had, had, had many sub camps. Is it possible to map the number of, of prisoners in each and perhaps from surviving evidence, relative degrees of, of, of suffering? And um, just one last extremely short one uh, uh, from Jane Klinger. Who, who was fascinated by the mapping of the testimonies of the death march. Um, would you please share the, uh, the reference for that, Tim? Yeah, um, Jane, just a quick, um, uh, that's in uh, a book that I co-edited called um, Geographies of the Holocaust. So it's, a, it's called Geographies of the Holocaust and it's a book I co-edited. Um, and I think it's such an extraordinary project uh, by quite brilliant cartographer, Eric Steiner, who I'm just starting to work with now on a new project. Um, so I'm intrigued to see what he'll come up with next. Um, I noticed there was a, a question from Angskra about digital mapping projects. And I think this is one of the challenges is that a number of digital mapping projects are springing up, but in a sense, I don't think they're all curated in a single space and they don't interact with each other. And one of the things that I think would be really good to think about more is about how can, in a sense, all of the individual work we're all doing, um, because increasingly people are doing digital mapping projects, how could it talk to each other? How could we generate, maybe through something like um, ERI, through the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure, a common set of practices such that the maps can interact and such that, in a sense, individual researchers and, and memory institutions can borrow and use the maps of others and contribute and add to those. Um, how, you know, school kids or citizen science uh, might be involved in that process as well. I noticed someone um, talked about education. In some ways, these maps, I think, have a role in education, but I think also, um, you know, um, school kids might well be involved in, in mapping themselves. Um, to the question of, of denial, and I think also to the question that Rosemary and Jonathan raise, um, one of the things that's, that's the most challenging about a digital map um, is that it demands um, uh, a, an underlying source base um, that is variable in um, its quality. So you can only map what you have, and as historians, we know this, um, we're not un unused to this. As historians, we're used to archives having gaps and holes in them. And, and, and having piles of stuff from certain places and next to nothing from others. Um, we know this of the, of the Nazi um, system. We know um, that not only were camps intentionally destroyed, um, if you think of a place like um, Treblinka or Belzec raised to the ground after Polish Jews had been killed there, but also the archives um, around camps were destroyed. Um, intentionally destroyed. And so the archival traces are, are, are very um, variable. What I think we could do a lot more with um, is to do much more in terms of mapping the ITS archives. Um, the, the, the wealth of data within the ITS archives, I think could really usefully be mapped. 
But one thing that I think, I think is critical is to recognize um, not just the gaps in the map as a result of, as I suggested, um, the nature of the testimony and the fact that um, the experience was dislocating, but also the archival maps and in in, um, gaps in the map. And I think this is one of the pieces of work that I, I'm doing a lot of work on at the moment um, and are just, uh, just about to start a new project on, is to think about how we can map fuzzy data, how we can map uncertainty, how we can map the nature of historical archives. And so one thing I, I think is true of, of this work is that I think it is an important part of the, the larger historical memory project of countering denial, in that it points to the vast number of, 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 of camps, it points to the vast number of, of ghettos. But I think one thing we do also need to be cognizant of is that the archives themselves um, have holes in them and gaps in them. And I think part of the kind of work of historians is being true to that. Is, is mapping out the absence as well as the, as the presence, not just within the testimonial archive, but also within the institutional archive. Thank you, Tim. Um, Agnes Corrie has been waiting with supreme patience with her hand showing. Agnes, please unmute and ask, ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so um, is there any room space for so-called smaller events when you are mapping. You, you showed Budapest and the architecture and all that. So one example which is in my mind is like the Danube. Um, would there be any space in your work for mapping the Danube, which uh, was not a death march, but a lot of people were taken there and shot into the Danube, which I'm sure you know. So sorry, I'm, you know. So if you could just tell me whether there would be space for mapping the Danube killing and similar atrocities. That's my question. Thank you, Agnes. Um, thank you for the question. Um, oh. I, I think absolutely. I think there's absolutely a place for mapping anything. In a sense, I think that's one of the things about mapping is that I think mapping can it, it, is, it, is, has endless possibilities. And I think you're right, Agnes, that there would be something really important about trying to map um, the killings that take place within Budapest in 1944. Because I think this is one of the really um, important and often under um, acknowledged parts of the genocide that rather than the killing taking place far away from urban centers in places like Treblinka or Belzec or in a place like Auschwitz taking place in the heart of a European capital city late in 1944 is a genocide um, as Jews are shot um, by the arrow cross into the Danube. One of the pieces of work that's really interesting um, I think in that um, context um, is um, the work of a, a Hungarian um, colleague who's been doing some work um, thinking in particular about mapping um, from the post-war trials, um, the, the Jews that were shot into the Danube and those who did the shooting, so the members of the Arrow Cross. And what you find is often that they're neighbors. So if you start to map out where those people lived, what you find is um, in, in a sense an incredibly intimate genocide akin, if you like, to the kind of intimate genocide of the first stage of the Einsatzgruppen killing, that it's literally a moment again of neighbors killing neighbors in the neighborhoods um, in the river. And so that's some of the work I think that's really um, interesting um, that's being done right at the moment. So absolutely, Agnes, the, the Danube, the Duna should be part of the story. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm Carol. Schling, you have your hand up. Would you like to unmute? Yes, sorry, my name is Eva Turner. I, I am oh, I'm sorry. I, I had a, a question um, which is sort of slightly sideways, I suppose. Um, there's a, uh, I know there's a, a, a Amata historian who have mapped um, the journey of Verba and Wetzler from Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. um, uh, their escape and we bought that route as a group and uh, what that brought to us was how uh, that mapping of that route has actually brought in uh, people who were uh, intimately involved in that escape but were not Jews and were in fact helping and I was wondering whether uh, uh, mapping 
uh, that way would and, and and they had to do a huge amount of research and they didn't have names and etc cetera, etc cetera. but that kind of mapping could also bring in actors which are outside the holocaust mm -hmm. i mean i think that's a brilliant question ava and and I think it points to something um, that Rachel talked about right at the beginning was about this relationship between mapping and walking. Um, this kind of retracing of routes is something that I think you see increasingly. The work of um, the American um, Jewish photographer Susan Silas is really interesting. She does a, um, a project called Helmbrecht's Walk where she retraces um, one of the death marches um, and takes a photograph each um, day um, along the route. Um, and she's engaged in that. I mean, one thing actually just on a side, which I've always been fascinating is she calls it the Helbrecht's walk, not the Helbrecht's march, because she recognizes that her motion through the landscape is different. She's not claiming that she's in a sense in the place of the victim, retracing the route who were marched. She's someone who's freely walking of her own accord. And she, she brings that critical distance, which I think is really important. Um, but I think you're right that retracing a route points, it draws attention to all of the points along the way that often I think the way we primarily think is about where do they leave from, Brubba from Auschwitz, and where do they arrive to, you know, getting to Prague or to Budapest. We, we think less about actually, well, how do they get from A to B and what happens along the way? And I think a lot of the, the work, in particular on death march, is really important around this, around the fact that the death marches are taking Jews into Germany and they're passing through German villages and towns right in front of the homes of, of, of Germans who are for the first time seeing Jews and prisoners from the concentration camp system at this late stage of the war being marched in front of their, their front gardens. And that attention to detail of what happens along the way is something that often the map doesn't do because the map often is about two points. A classic location map is two points. It's point of departure and point of arrival and a line drawn between the two. And as you point out, Ava, I think actually walking along that suggests that it's really important to think about what happens along the way. Who sees this? Who helps? Who harms? What's the nature of the interaction between um, news, uh, Jews and non-Jews? Final thought on Vrubber is that they themselves draw a map, don't they? And one thing that I think is really interesting is to think about map drawing during the Holocaust, um, not just by the Nazi state. The Nazi state um, and their collaborators are involved in map drawing as they enact the Holocaust, but Jews themselves are also involved in map drawing as they draw out routes for escape, as they draw out a nature of what their situation is. And so maps themselves, historical maps, I think, are, are part of the relatively untouched source base um, that I think historians um, could do um, a lot more work with. Tim, just just a glance at the chat will show you the um, extreme interest and enthusiasm your lecture has um, uh, um, um, elicited. And so I have one last and sort of appropriate question in that light. I don't know what sort of an answer you can give, but it's from Tatiana Lichtenstein, who um, asks, um, can you give any guidance um, over ideas and tr or, or training that people um, uh, uh, can undertake if they want to do this sort of work themselves? Is this the sort of work that, um, uh, as it were, um, non-professional um, uh, um, historians are able to undertake? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like Tatiana's question because she says, when we're done with the tracing paper. Yes, exactly. Once you're, so, yes. The, once you're done with the tracing paper, Tatiana, I absolutely think um, there are um, opportunities. I think there's a whole um, range of technologies out there, um, some of which are open source and some of which are proprietary, some of which lend themselves to much more visualization and some much more to statistical analysis. Um, and so what I'd do is I'd, I'd start with um, Google Maps in many ways, is, is what's the data you're working with um, and how can you just drop a pin into Google Maps to try and start to think about, well, how, like what's happening where? to start with a really simple work of location mapping. And I think that can be done through a whole lot of different, um, uh, uh, very simple um, open access, open source um, software. It's a great thing to do in the classroom with students. Um, it's a great thing to do in some ways um, whilst working with a set of sources or even working with a memoir or, or a survivor you know, like could I start to map that out? 
onto the Google map of Europe just to think about um, where they went um, and how far are those places from each other? And what's, as Ava said, what's the nature of getting from A to B and what happens along the way? I think at the kind of higher end in some ways, um, Tatiana, um, ArcGIS is the thing that most people use. Um, that does take some work to get um, to grips with it. There's plenty of courses available um, uh, to train you in, in using that. And I think the thing that ArcGIS does allow is it does allow um, much more spatial analysis. So rather than just thinking about spatial patterns and visualizing them, it allows you to do spatial analysis, which is to start thinking about the nature of relationships uh, between different elements of the map. And so that's something um, that has possibility. Um, but in a sense, my, my top tip would be to um, find a friendly geographer. And in a sense, that's what I've done. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of this work suggests is, 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 the, is, the, is the need for collaborative work. You know, one thing I think as historians we're often bad at doing is, is collaborative work. We tend to be sole scholars. Um, so most of us um, work alone in the archive um, and write um, uh, uh, books alone. And one thing that working in this way in the digital humanities has really shown me is the value of working with others with different skill sets. And so one of the things that I think has been really exciting about these projects has been getting historians and geographers together to work together to bring their different skills onto the table. And in many ways, I think one of the futures perhaps for a lot of um, the work that we maybe need to do um, both in memory projects and historical projects around the Holocaust is to work better together, is to think about how we can work together in larger teams to bring different language skills to the table, but also to bring different digital skills or mapping skills um, to the table. Thank you, Tim. And I think just in a way sort of picking up on those last comments about the importance of collaboration, what remains in the short time we have left is for me to give some thanks. Um, thanks um, to everyone um, uh, who has come, uh, I'm in such large numbers, um, who have come along to this extraordinary, I mean, stimulating, fascinating event this evening, um, especially uh, to those who asked such um, um, careful and, and, and illuminating questions. My apologies to those um, whose questions uh, uh, weren't aired. I'd also like to thank um, Claire and the Institute for Historical Research. Uh, the partnership between the IHR uh, and BISA is a long-standing one um, over this annual event. It's one which I, and we can see from everyone who has turned up, um, so many people value really, really highly. So, uh, uh, so thank you, Claire, um, and also your team who have helped to facilitate this event uh, this evening. Uh, however, last and most of all, um, I'd like to extend thanks on behalf of us all to Tim for, um, uh, for your extremely generous answers to, to the questions and comments, but above all for a talk which managed to be crystal clear and exciting at the same time and to give us a, a, such a vivid sense of how new techniques, new thinking can help illumine historical and, and ethical questions which are which are not new, which are old, but which uh, continue to um, uh, uh, trouble us all and um, exert a pull on, on all our minds and, and our imaginations. So Tim, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>